So I just want to uh, pick up where we left off last time. So last time uh, I had described two three-dimensional, or well, I had described uh, two three-dimensional like classical field theories uh, that one can get starting from um, a hyperkähler manifold with a hyperhamiltonian G action and like a permuting action of the unit quaternions. Uh, and the first one uh, was called the 3DA model. Um, and the reason it's like the 3DA model is because we'll s see later on uh, is that it's like some sort of categorification of the, of the ordinary 2DA model um, of that, well, of uh, the GIT quotient of uh, X by G. And uh, like what we learned, uh, or, or what, I, what I explained last time, is that the way that one describes this thing as I had like described some uh, untwisted supersymmetric field theory that had like a whole bunch of uh, cop copies of the group SP1 acting everywhere. And in this 3DA model, you take your untwisted theory and you identify uh, the copy of the unit quaternions that is being identified uh, spin three, like acting on R3. And you identify that with this copy of SP1H, which is acting on X. So like, you identify those two groups. And then you need to choose also a uh, maximal torus uh, inside of the other group SP1C uh, that, that I described last time. And that group was acting on, um, on, on this field, which was our vector multiple uh, scalar. And choosing this U1, it chooses a complex structure so like if you think of SP1 as acting on the quaternions, choosing this U1 chooses a complex structure on the quaternions. Look, it's the same data. And when I have this complex structure, it lets me break up this field that would have been valued in the imaginary quaternions. It lets me break it into like real uh, and complex parts, I explained last time. And so then the, uh, the fields in this, and this uh, theory like also depends on like a background uh, spin bundle uh, and then the, the fields in this theory are basically a principal bundle on my three manifold connection on that principal bundle. Um, and then uh, a section of, uh, well, I can take my principal bundle, my G principal bundle, and I can take my spin bundle. Uh, and my spin here is spin three, which is the thing I was calling SP1. E. Uh, so I can uh, take the product of these two bundles. And then I have X is actually a G times SP1 H space, but I'm identifying SP1 H and SP1 E. So I can uh, use those to twist X into a bundle over M3. And so I can take a section of that bundle, and that's a one last field. And then I have this vector multiple scalar that I was talking about before, which is just uh, there's a real one and a complex one, basically fields on M3, either valued, scalar fields, either valued in the Lie algebra and the complex Lie algebra. And then the equations that I got um, were basically like a Dirac equation for S, uh, like a nonlinear Dirac equation. Uh, and then a bunch of kind of dumb equations that like uh, this complex field is covariantly constant. A bunch of these commutators are all zero. Um, and then uh, the more interesting equation, uh, this one, um, uh, I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, so it's basically that the Hodge star of the curvature uh, is equal to uh, the derivative uh, of my uh, real vector multiplet scalar with respect to my connection, uh, plus uh, the moment map uh, composed with my section. And like basically because of the twisting I've done, this thing is actually like a one form valued in the adjoint bundle. And so this equation like actually makes sense. Um, and uh, just a few reminders about some things that we said about uh, these equations the other day. So this Dirac equation, uh, like if I choose a, if I have a three manifold uh, and uh, that's like of the form that, that locally looks like R times C, then basically this Dirac equation. Um, so if my so if my three manifold is R times C. This Dirac equation 
you can basically write out um, as um, d bar of s uh, plus uh, like j uh, ds dt. So basically, in particular, when uh, my sections are constant in the t direction, then I'm just asking for things to be like polymorphic. Um, so that's uh, so that's like one one thing that's like a little bit uh, useful to remember. And then uh, that this piece of the equation, if you didn't have any uh, x, like if your x was a point, then you wouldn't have this moment map term. And then this term is like something that's like very famous. So this is, or this is like basically what are called like the Bogomoni equations. So these are equations uh, that describe like uh, uh, magnetic monopoles. Uh, and then the other uh, specialization that's kind of interesting is if I didn't have this sigma term and I just had this curvature term uh, being equal to the moment map, and like let's suppose that I was like in like this sort of scenario when I'm in like an R times C, and I've sort of asked for my connection to be like kind of uh, trivial in like the t direction, then basically you're just setting like a vortex equation. Um, like basically like this thing just, uh, so this is like some mix of like the vortex equations and the Bogomoni equations and the Dirac equation. It's kind of like, so you can sort of study it by mixing these things up. Um, so that's like what this uh, 3DA model is. And then uh, in, in a minute, I'll tell you how to describe this thing in a more, uh, in a more algebraic language. Uh, basically, because this description, as good as it is, I only told you about uh, like what the bosonic fields are doing. And for like some of the quantization stuff that we're going to do later, it's nice to know about what the fermions are. Um, um, and then there was the second field theory that I described. And this one's a lot simpler. So this one's the 3D B model. So this one, you're identifying SP1E and SP1C and choosing a U1 inside of uh, SP1H. And just like last time, this SP1H is acting on X, and so choosing this U1 is the same as choosing a complex structure on X. And then my fields uh, in this thing are still a, um, a G bundle, and then now I can combine uh, my connection here and my uh, adjoint valued scalars, I can combine them into a complex connection, uh, and then I can also uh, have my section of like my twisted bundle. Um, and because like I'm doing different identifications, right, these things are living in different, different spaces. And then my equations become pretty simple. So one of them is just that uh, I ask for my connection to be flat. I ask for my section to be covariantly constant, um, which is like pretty, uh, pretty simple. Uh, I ask for, uh, now that I have a complex structure on X, I can break my moment map up into real and complex parts. I ask for the complex part of the moment map to vanish. And then I have like basically a real um, like a real equation here, uh, which is going to impose some kind of a stability. Um, and then uh, just the thing to notice is that like if I were studying equations, you know, solutions to this equation, and I asked for them to be like constant in the time direction, this is literally just like constant map equation. Um, and this is like exactly the kind of thing uh, that like gives you the ordinary 2 dB model. So th this is like, again, like it, it looks very much uh, pretty much like the 2 dB model. Um, and before like, I uh, describe this thing in a more algebra geometric sort of way, I want to tell you about some natural deformations uh, that will probably come up in uh, Andrea's talk. Or maybe the, I should say that there's some natural like, parameters that you can use to modify uh, what I've said. So the first one uh, are like the FI parameters. Uh, and so these guys live inside of, um, oh, I'm sorry, they, it's not really uh, they live inside of uh, the space of characters of, of my Lie algebra, G, um, tensored with uh, a copy of the imaginary quaternions, which is acted on by SP1H. So this is what they look like in the, uh, in the uh, untwisted theory. And, similar, and then there's a second parameter, which is called like a mass parameter. Uh, so for this mass parameter, uh, these things are going to live inside of F 
tensored with a copy of the imaginary quaternions uh, that, are, uh, that are acted upon by FP1C, and this F is gonna be the following. Um, so let me choose uh, a group F that's acting on X, that's hyper-Hamiltonian, so it's some, some Lie group. So it has uh, a hyper-Hamiltonian action, so there's a moment map, just like in the other case, and then that's commuting uh, with uh, G and SP1. So this thing is called uh, the flavor symmetry. And then this is a parameter that lives in the Lie algebra uh, of, the, of the flavor symmetry. And then if I like look at these things in the A twist, uh, well my mass, so what ends up happening is that uh, now when I'm in the A twist, I'm identifying SP1C and SP1H, so this thing becomes a one form uh, valued um, on M3, uh, valued in this space of characters. Uh, but this thing uh, basically sits inside uh, of uh, the space of one form valued in the adjoint of the Lie algebra. Um, and uh, so, that, so that's where like this parameter t lives. Oh, and sorry, I should have told you like what this thing does to the equations. The thing that this thing changes in the equations is that you should replace your moment map by mu plus t. And so you'll notice that now, because t lives here, it's the kind of thing that you could put into uh, this equation. Um, so, thing, so things make sense. Uh, and this one, this one changes your, um, your, your phi, uh, basically, to phi. Um, uh, so anyway, so this, right, so this a phi parameter in the A twist looks this way. In the B twist, uh, because I have this U1C, it's going to just break up into real and imaginary parts. But it's going to stay a scalar. Um, and then in the B twist, uh, things are the opposite. So my mass parameter uh, breaks uh, it into a real and imaginary parts. Or sorry, yeah, real and complex parts, sorry. Uh, and then my uh, mass parameter uh, connection on a trivial F bundle. Um, and uh, the point is, is that these things, you, you might notice that there's kind of like a lot of symmetry in the way these things behave, and these parameters get swapped. Under the So, so each, each twisted theory has only one set of parameters. Like A has only T and B has only M. They can no, 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 but they have both. Basically, I'm, I'm just saying, like, a, oh, uh. Like once you twist, you're free to Did take I write this thing right? Oh, I'm sorry. I, like, swap. I wrote this all wrong. Uh, uh, I, I did my columns, like, exactly wrong. <laughs> sorry. This should have been here. Um, if, if I was writing this, uh, if you notice, I put my things in the wrong columns. And then here, uh, my uh, M was breaking into a, uh... no. no, sorry. Sorry, this one should have been in the B twist, this thing breaks into real and complex parts. Here, this one breaks into real and complex parts. And then uh, here it should have been inside of the connections. But anyway, they both have both. Yeah, no, what is the line above? It says mu is mu plus t and the phi is phi plus t. Oh, that's just like how they change the equations. Once you twist. Like just look for the mu in this equation. Ah, once you twist the equation. In the untwisted version. Okay. Well, and then that tells you how it happens everywhere else. I see, okay. So just like go, go into the equation and everywhere you see a mu. Okay, I see. So what happens with supersymmetry in this, when you exist. Sorry? What happens with the supersymmetry? Do you break it? Or? Uh, it does, so it doesn't break the supersymmetry. It does break. Um, so the, this, these equations I wrote down were basically uh, SP. Um, 
or where spin invariant and this thing, like they might only make sense on like framed manifolds or like these things, like the symmetry properties of this thing can really break. Masses, masses must be in the commuting subalgebra. Sorry? Masses must be in the Cartan subalgebra. Oh, I mean, sure, okay. So yeah, uh, he's right. So it should be in the Cartan of that's sort of the, that's that's you know that's parallel to the other side too, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's a, that's why I needed. Yeah, basically the the Cartan condition is dual to the character condition. But when you say the, the flavor symmetry is just appearing here for the first time, so yeah, yeah I've never used you whatever you want. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, there's like some biggest one. Okay. That, that, that's uh, that's right. Uh, yeah, but I, I haven't like tried to like uh, uh, say this uh, in a complicated way. Um, and so one thing that's like very nice to do here is if I break, um, so like you notice that like if I'm in a mirror symmetry situation, then I actually have chosen a U1 inside of SP1H and I've chosen a U1 inside of SP1C. And so it's actually, and like then I've identified SP1C and SP1H with the Euclidean one. So it's basically like nice to break, to, to make everything line up and then break my, uh, my SP1 Euclidean to a U1. And then basically now I can break all of my parameters into real and complex parts. Uh, in both twists. And uh, and it gives me like a little bit of like extra data. Like before, like in the A twist, like I didn't have any like distinguished complex structure on X. But like once I break this thing down, now I, now I, can, now I do. And then uh, you can rewrite the equations. On any M uh, with the transverse holomorphic foliation. So uh, basically what I mean by that is that locally, it looks like R times C um, in like an algebraic form. So this is like something that's like very handy to do because then now you can use like a Kobayashi Hitchin type result uh, in, in order to, uh, uh, like in order to make these things Nicer. So first, let me do this with like no masses and no FIs. Um, so in the A twist, uh, you're basically going to start out uh, with uh, basically a section stack. Uh, so basically, I'm going to look at um, so there's a couple of things that I'll have to explain in this. So first, don't uh, freak out that I have like, made a three manifold as an object of algebraic geometry. Um, so that's the first thing I'll have to explain. Uh, but then the second is that I can take uh, the Hamiltonian uh, reduction of G like with its chosen complex structure uh, and think of this thing as like a complex manifold if I take the Hamiltonian reduction. And then I can make this thing into a bundle using the square root of the canonical bundle on C, which is a one bundle. Um, and this thing has an action of um, U1 now, because I've broken my SP1 to U1. Um, OK, so let me like, try and explain like, what this thing means. Uh, sorry, so there's going to be some more stuff. So this is what's, uh, what the equations are going to be. So first, let me. Uh, explain this, this M1 Durand. So, uh, this is, so this is a thing that's like what's called like a derived stack. So one, um, one definition of, or one place where you can think of things, these as living, which isn't too complicated, is this is some object inside of functors from uh, DGAs to topological spaces. Like this is a, a um, generalization of like a normal, like a, 
like a normal scheme being like a functor from rings to sets, or a stack being a functor from rings to groupoids. So the thing is a functor from CG rings to topological spaces. And then uh, there is a, and if I have a topological space, I can make such a thing, and that's you just take the constant fun functor, which ascends every ring to this topological space. So that thing will not be, so that's like the constant, constant sheaf, and then you can sheafify it in whatever topology you're interested in, and that's like what object this is. It does not have to feel the smooth structure at all. It doesn't have a smooth structure at all. And so like basically this is a way that I can think of any manifold as being an object in derived algebraic geometry. Um, so this is what this M1 to ROM is. Uh, this is actually going to be a diff really secretly what I told you is like M1 Bendy, but uh, maybe I'll, but I, I don't want to have to have uh, too many things. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I won't lie. Um, so this thing is really what I've just called M1 uh, Betty. Um, anyway, so then my curve is a curve. That's not complicated. So then one can ask, like, what is a spin bundle on this? Well, I've like, reduced my, so I'm not supposed to be looking for like a spin three bundle anymore because I've reduced my structure group to U1. And so you can ask like, what happens to a spin bundle on a THF manifold? And basically it turns into the like a square root of the canonical bundle on the holomorphic part. So that's what this is coming into. So all I'm saying is that this is just saying that my X should be a spinner. And, not that and then, so this is just normal. And then uh, like in this uh, sort of a setting, this thing is just a name, this thing is just a synonym for uh, the, the complex moment map mod G, the zero level of the complex moment map mod G. Um, and this is basically because when I'm in this THS situation, this equation, I can like drop out the uh, complex part of the moment map. And so you can rewrite these equations in this way. So now I've explained everything except for this last Durham stack. Wait, is, it, is that the it's not the whole moment map? There's no semi-stability condition? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle stability conditions separately. So the stability condition is the, the rest of this equation, the real part of it. I broke, basically, I broke this equation into real and complex parts. Uh, and so the complex part is what I've just written down, but there's still a real part to handle. So you're right, so then there will be plus of stability. Uh, and that stability is going to end up just being positive map stability. So like what's going to end up happening is that like uh, this fi parameter is going to let me determine a open substack of this. And I'm just going to ask that my map generically lands in that open part. So it's going to have to be a quasi map. Um, okay, and then I haven't handled the mass parameter yet either, which is going to be some kind of like a fixed point uh, sort of thing. Okay, so that's like what these A-twists are. So this one was actually, the, oh sorry, and I haven't described like what this thing is. Uh, so this thing is like kind of awful. So I kind of said what it was the last time. If you really want a definition, uh, which is like not very helpful, is uh, for, any, uh, for any stack Z, um, there is, you can find a uh, groupoid over it, which is, you can take z squared, which is two projections, and then you can complete this thing around the diagonal copy of z. So this thing is a groupoid that with base, uh, and then the, the identity is the diagonal. So this thing is a groupoid that's living over z. Um, and basically, like, you should think of it as that there's an arrow between two points of Z if, it, if and only if they're um, infinitesimally close. Like, like, that's what this, like, complete around the diagonal means. Like, if I had not done this, it would have just been that there would have been an arrow between any two points, uh, like any two points of Z. But now, because I've completed this thing around uh, this, the diagonal, now it's only for points that are infinitesimally close. And then the Z to ROM is actually the quotient. So that's one definition that, that's real. Um, but the important thing that we need to know about it is what I told you last time, which is that functions on this thing are Durham cohomology. And then if you think of what a quasi-coherent sheaf on this thing is, you can actually work out that the equivariant structure for this groupoid is exactly the same thing as a, being, uh, having a connection, or a flat connection. So this is like a growth and Deke's definition of a D module, or like of a, of a connection. Um, OK, so that's like what this terrible object is. Okay, so this one was like kind of bad, the other one's much easier. Um, so the B-type one, um, 
I, I was a bit confused why you started talking about the DHF. Huh? Why you why you mentioned transversely homomorphic collision? You're still in n equals four situation. Uh, because like I needed it to like write this thing down in holomorphic language. Like basically, right in these equations, I can't like talk about like any complex structure on uh, X until like I break the like the spin three symmetry. Because spin three is rotating the complex structures. But this a to a fully twisted, a twisted theory defined on arbitrary m three. Yeah, it's defined on arbitrary M3 by saying if I have a THF structure, then I can write it down in a simpler way. Like, like, I, like I'm saying, it's defined at all times, but if you like have, if you are in the simpler setting, then like want, you can like write it, like write down the equations in a more concise manner. Um, and now, like, and now the, the advantage is like now this is an object of algebraic geometry, whereas the equations of motion I had here were just some random C infinity thing. So an example would be like a, a circle bundle over a Riemann surface or something? Circle bundle over a Riemann surface. That's like the, uh, the, the, main, the, the main example. Um, but basically, like, you know, it's just kind of nice to have this description because it's an algebraic geometry now. Okay, and so this other one for the B-twist, it's much, much easier. Um, so basically, there's like two ways that you can do it. Um, so the first one is that you can just like take M3 and I can just think of it as an object of algebraic geometry. Um, and then I can just map that into S mod G. Or um, this, the, the other way is I can do it is I can do it with the Durham stack. And then I can also map it into X mod G. So these are both, um, so, or sorry, if, I, if I'm in this other language, I can write it as like R or M1 Betty. What is C here? In the twist, in the, what, yeah, what is C? It's a curve. What curve? Any curve. Uh, sorry, I mean, I'm imagining you're starting with the manifold and you just have this. My M3 is, an R, is, R, is M1 times C. Like I, I said, like I'm choosing like a THF, like, 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 like I'm in this THF setting. Uh, M3 is uh, basically, I'm just choosing the simplest one. Like the simplest kind of THF manifold is this. Okay, um, okay. And I'm just like, uh, telling you that you can write things down in this way. Um, and these things have like slightly different behavior if you're in algebraic geometry instead of, um, uh, if, instead of um, analytic geometry. These things become the same if you consider them as analytic stacks, but they have slightly different, uh, slightly different behavior uh, if you think of them as, uh, maybe for curves they don't, uh, but like if I were to put in like S1 or punctured disks and things, these things behave a little bit differently. But the, these things are both the same, and there was one minor thing, and that is that actually this U1 action that I said that I had around becomes the grading on this thing. And so this is, what I said is almost literally true, except for here you have to regrade this. Um, so let me like say like what, what exactly is going on. So the way that like the cohomological grading works in these theories is this, I have this U1 action, or this U1 instead of SP1, and then this thing was mapping, acting on X. So like, let me just choose like a very simple example of such a kind of thing. Like if I had like T star C, I could choose like a U1 action where basically the base has like weight zero. Uh, so like this thing maybe has coordinates like X and Y, and I get to choose an action such that like X has degree zero and Y has degree two. And basically like in, when I do the twist, this U1 action becomes my homological grading. And so like now I can't think of T star C as being like an ordinary scheme anymore. I have to think of it as being a DG scheme where like maybe I would write it as like C times C dual where I'd move the C dual to live in cohomological degree two. So when I write this like regrade, so when I write this like regraded thing, uh, what I mean by that is I've like changed, like I, if this thing were affine, I've just changed the degrees of my standard functions using this U1 grading and thinking of it as a DG scheme. Um, and the important thing about this is that this thing is two shifted. Uh, so let me say exactly what, what I mean by that. Uh, so I mean by that is in this example, I mean that dx by, d, uh, by uh, dy is my symplectic form, or my holomorphic symplectic form. It has weight two under this action, therefore it's gonna be a degree two form. Like it's not gonna be a degree zero form anymore. 
Um, so anyway, so this is something that's like a little bit weird and will come up at one point. Okay, so any, any questions about this before I move on? Wait, sorry, when you, when you twist by the, uh, by the square of the canonical bundle, that's because, is it like an R charge acting on the... Yeah, that, that, that was because this thing used to be a spinner. Uh -huh. And basically, if you take the spin bundle on a THF manifold, it looks like a tr trivial but at all times like a square root of the canonical bundle in the holomorphic direction. Okay. So this so this is just saying that like my field was a spinner before. This is just some like fancy way of putting that down. Okay, so this is like it's basically just at one point it's gonna it's gonna be important that we know that this was a degree two. Um, the other thing you could do is you could just collapse the whole grading of this theory and just think of everything as being Z two graded manifolds, and then you don't have to think about that anymore. Uh, then, then like, but then your homological algebra is more complicated. Okay, so that's uh, these things, uh, and then I didn't say like what these uh, parameters do. So this fi parameter basically determines uh, a stability condition on uh, x mod g. So that just picks out some open subset, and I can just ask for things to generically live in that open subset. That's my stability. Sorry, yeah, so my fi parameter chooses like some open subset inside of this guy. And then my mass parameter is the more interesting one. So my, my mass parameter, uh, and let me assume actually that, uh, sorry, and to do that I needed to assume that my t was integral. Right, to, to convert, uh, to do git, like you have to choose like a rational like a, like a rational t. So let me just assume that's an integer, and similarly let me assume that my m is integral. So that tells me that it's really a C star action and not an action of just like a vector, and not just a vector field. So then this mass parameter basically gives me a coordinate, like a, a thing where I can look at like x mod g. Uh, I could look at its fixed points under my flavor symmetry. Uh, my chosen one for the M, and then there's like an attracting set. And I could put T's in here if I wanted, uh, correspondence. And so basically whenever I have this mass parameter, somehow I'm gonna need to use this, uh, this fixed point to attracting set correspondence. Uh, and whenever I have the FI parameter, I'm gonna impose a stability using this open subset. And that's like how you modify things. Um, sorry, these are both if I had a real FI and a real mass. And I'm never going to work with complex masses and complex FIs. Um, okay. Uh, if, if it was TC, it would. TC enters the, like, the... Uh, yeah, I'm just okay. purely real. Okay. Yeah, so I said real and real. Uh, okay. and, and, I, and I won't talk about the complex ones, but they do. They just, the complex ones in some ways are a little easier and a little bit less interesting. Um, so I'm not going to think. And they're, they're less easy to think about. The real one is the hard one. Okay, so sorry, that was a little bit rough. Um, all right, so now let's try and think about uh, the following. So now I want to try and think about the local operators in, uh, in the 3 d CPLT. Um, okay, so what is this? Um, so this is the following thing. So for any three-dimensional TQFT, which remember is some functor from the category of three cobordisms uh, to two categories that are C-linear, uh, Z of S2 is going to be, uh, is an E3 algebra. Okay, so what, what do I mean by that? So an E3 algebra has the following uh, sort of structure. So basically I should, for every, So for every pair of points in the plane, or maybe I should say for every just configuration of points in the plane, so like P and Q, I should get 
inside of comp two. Oh, sorry, this should be an R three. I should get a product, and then it should. Um, and in this case, the product will be commutative because you can, in the configuration space of two points in R three, you can connect any pair of point, any configuration to any other configuration. So basically, um, I'm going to get a product. And the way that this is going to work out is uh, you can just excise the balls around these points. And then choose a big ball All around them. Sorry. Why is the target two category, not three category? Sorry? Why is the target category two, two category, not three? Because like the KRS category is a two category, it's not a three category. Huh? Because it is. I mean, like, a, think of your example. Your favorite example is the KRS category, right? Kapustin, Rosansky, Solana, and that's a two category, not a three category. So I want to assign a two, a two category to a point, not a three category to a point. So it needs to go to two category. I mean, this is just the axiomatization. And similarly, like, if I had a 2D theory, I just want a, I just want a category, not a two category. It's always n. It's always n and n minus one. Basically, associate the number to three manifold, the vector space to two manifold, the category to one manifold, and the two category to zero manifold. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so the the way that this thing is in E3 algebra is I take these points and I get uh, and I turn them into a cobordism in the way that I just said, and then I apply my uh, TQ of T to them, and I would get a function like this. Or I'd get a function like this. Um, okay, so that's, and basically the point is, is I can do this for like every uh, configuration of two points in the plane, and like you can, and these things like vary in a smooth, or in a continuous way, these products. So I have like a continuously varying family of products. Uh, a more interesting thing, Yeah, so like maybe a more formal way of writing it is I have an operation from chains on configurations of two points in R3, uh, tensor with two copies of my Z of the two sphere. Um, to Z of the two sphere. That's like, more, uh, that's like a more formal way of writing the same thing, because then for every point it gives me a chain, and then uh, then like if I fix a fix a given zero chain, then that gives me just an ordinary map. And then the, the interesting thing is that there's a particularly interesting example in here, is there's the class of, uh, uh, the fundamental class of the configurations of two points in R3, which is homotopic to an S2. And so this gives me some sort of a degree two operation. And this thing, it turns out, gives me a Poisson bracket. Uh, a Poisson bracket on Z of S2 of cohomological degree 2. And this is highly related to this regrading that I was talking about here, where this thing became a degree 2 form. OK, so this is uh, like what an E3 algebra is. So basically, for each chain, uh, like on, on the space of configurations, I get, I get some sort of an operation. Um, and this is like the like the first like interesting thing that you can get out of it out of a TQFT. And let me say like one other thing about it, uh, and that's what's called omega background or omega deformation. So a variant on this construction, which is called uh, an omega background. is uh, I can look at Z of S2, since I'm in a TQF, since U1 acts on S, S2, uh, U1 acts on, uh, or maybe I should say SO, SO2 acts uh, on this thing by rotations, I can take like the SO2 fixed points, like choose an SO2 and SO3. Um, and this thing uh, 
it turns out, uh, is actually an E1 algebra, just an ordinary associative algebra. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that uh, now, like all of my configurations that I want to look at have to be U1 invariant. So basically, you choose some line inside of R3, and you have this like SO2 acting around it. And now I'm only allowed to pick configurations of points uh, that fit like on this line. And uh, now that forces, that now I can no longer switch them while staying on the line. So now I don't have a commutative product anymore. Now I have a, just a plain old associative product. But a cool fact is uh, that the class of, uh, so basically suppose that this is my first point and this is my second point. Uh, then there's like another class where I could choose this to be my second point and this to be my first point. And uh, in terms of this like homotopy of the configuration space of two points in the plane, so under like uh, the homotopy of two points in R3 to S2, these things just go, this class would be like zero for like a, and this one would be. And so then there's an equation inside of here, which is the class of zero minus the class of infinity inside of the equivariant cohomology of the configuration space is just h bar times the class of h2, where h bar is my equivariant parameter. And uh, this is telling me that uh, in this uh, in this cohomology group, or sorry, in this uh, thing where I've taken my state space on the two-sphere and taking the SO2 invariance, this is telling me that if I take the product in one way and take the difference with the product of the other way in my associative algebra, that basically up to h bar, this is exactly the same thing as the Poisson bracket. And so this is like something that's like very normal from like the theory of deformation quantization, like that like you know, your commutator in this algebra is equal to h bar of the Poisson bracket in my whole algebra. So this is telling me that this thing is a deformation quantization of my original. So this, so, okay, so this is the kind of thing that we should expect to get out of these two 3D A and B models. I should expect to get an E3 algebra and a deformation quantization. Uh, is there anything you can do, like, does this have like all the information of this one? Or, I mean, like, I mean, maybe I'll ask you, uh, what information does this contain that the deformation quantization doesn't contain? Uh, nothing, it's always set h bar to zero. I mean, I could always get my original thing back by setting h bar to zero. Yeah, right. Then you wouldn't know the E3, like, you know, you have an E1 algebra. That's uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I guess, like, you would say, like, that, yeah, I guess uh, it depends on, but there's, like, a formality theorem, right, that tells you that uh, an E3 algebra is the same thing as a P2 algebra, so, like, an algebra with a degree 2 Poisson bracket, and I can get that back. So, by formality, possibly nothing. Um, like, like, I, like uh, I think of, there's probably nothing extra. But it's not obvious how you recover the E3 structure from just the bracket. Like th that's like what formality, uh, formality is. Okay, so let's let's do this. Z of S2 is just a commutative algebra. Huh? You think if Z of S2 is just a commutative algebra with the cohomology? Yeah, yeah, the cohomology with, with with the bracket. Yeah. So let me let me uh, say one other thing. And so our expectation for how this thing should work is that the way that I should get the z of s2 is I should look at the equations of motion of my theory. That, and it turns out on the two-sphere, and it turns out that in these examples, like because of the way I've set everything up, this thing will always be a symplectic uh, stack. And then uh, what I should do is I should do geometric quantization of that. So uh, this is easiest. When, uh, so let's call this thing uh, z. So this is easiest when z is equal to the cotangent bundle or something. Uh, or actually, we call it case. 
And then this thing would just be equal to functions under this. So uh, for that reason, I'm going to restrict now to the, to the case when x is, is a cotangent bundle. It's t star of a representation. Uh, the reason is, is because otherwise doing this quantization is very difficult. The other uh, thing that I want to say is that in this THF language, uh, you often replace S2 by the following guy. So if you had like a C times R, and then like suppose like I excise like a point from it, you can rewrite this thing uh, you can basically think of this thing as being like two disks glued together across a punctured disk. So my, so my analog of my holomorphic version of the two-sphere is going to be two copies of the disk glued together across the punctured disk. My disk is the spec of power series, and my punctured disk is spec of log series. So this is just like something that's like handy to use, which is going to let us stay in algebraic geometry land. OK, so let's figure out what these things are in some examples. So I'm going to do the B model first, because that one's boring. So is this a THF preserving deformation? If you replace S2 by such device, is that the idea? Yeah. Well, I'm not even sure that the S2 is like a valid thing. Maybe I would say that like this is something that makes sense as THF, and then if I'm in a setting where I'm just topological, I could deform that to a, an S2. I would say it the opposite way. That basically in the THF language, it's always fine to use this disk thing, and then if I were topological, I could turn it into an S2. Is this for the B twist, this what you do? Uh, and this is for all the twists. But, well, why S2 doesn't make sense in THF? It just it doesn't have a THF. Well, I guess well, S2 oh, yeah, plus yeah. R uh, has a THF. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then, I can, then I can do that. I, uh, I just don't want to. This is the better one. Basically, I don't want to make any claims about whether those are the same. Uh, I think they're actually probably not. Uh, yeah, they're not because the canonical bundles are different. Like P1 has a canonical bundle, and this thing does not have a canonical bundle. So they're not the same. But if you went topological, then they turn the same. Anyway, I really like don't want to like spend a bunch of time belaboring like kind of things. So they're why we never talk about anything. Okay, so let's do this in this case. So I said I want to look at uh, my equations on the my equations of motion on the two sphere. So I said that that is the same thing as just looking at this S two Betty uh, mapping into X mod G. Um, okay, so like what you should think of is this is supposed to be like a connection on S2. You had a times M1 Betty. Huh? You had times M1 Betty before. Uh, but I'm not doing that anymore. I'm only looking at it on S2, not on a three manifold. Oh, OK. Anyway, and this thing has been regraded. Um, you could think of it as just doing, changing my M1 to R. And then that wouldn't do anything. So, th so there's this space. Um, and like classically, what you would tell me is that this is exactly the same thing as x minus g created. Is you would tell me like there's only one flat g bundle on S2, and like basically like I'm asking for a flat section of like this twisted x bundle. So basically, there's just the constant sections labeled by x, and that's it. But as a thing in derived geometry, uh, this two sphere, uh, its affinization is uh, this. The ring, the ring of functions, sorry, on this two-sphere is, um, it's got like one class, it's its cohomology, and it's basically like it's got one class x that lives in, that squares to zero, and x lives in degree two. And so if you work out like what happens when you look at maps out of that ring into here, or like, sorry, speak of this ring into here, you'll find that you pick up a, an additional derived direction, which will be a minus two shifted tangent bundle. So basically, like as a classical thing, you can't see this. Like this is some purely like derived direction. It comes from like uh, like fluctuations in the cohomology, like of S two. 
Um, and like what this thing is, is that normally, right, a tangent bundle is you just take sim of the, co of the cotangent complex and take spec of that. And I'm just putting that in a weird cohomological degree and then taking spec of it. Okay, so this thing is like what you get as this ring of functions. Just, just to let you know, you're, you're out of time. Oh. Okay, so let me finish this off then. So using my symplectic form, uh, you can uh, change this thing. You know, normally with a symplectic form, I could change a tangent bundle to a cotangent bundle. But then since it's a two-shifted form, this switches from a minus two thing to an ordinary tangent bundle. And then I told you my rule for quantizing is that you just take functions on the base. So my, my answer is that in the B model, Z of S2 is just functions on my original variety, except for regraded. And uh, the Poisson bracket that I got from my E2 structure turns out that this thing matches my holomorphic form on X. But again, I told you that that thing got regraded to be two shifted. Like that was what this, like regrading was supposed to do, and that's like why it was necessary. So like I did this example with like the T star X, where I changed Y to be degree two, um, and that was necessary to make this all have the correct degree. Okay, so that's very unfortunate that I'm out of time, but no, I'll stop. So I guess I'll tell you about the Coulomb branch next time. We have time for a couple of questions. Transverse holomorphic foliation. Yeah, and so sorry. And so the thing that you were asking me now that I can like stop and pause and like uh, is that uh, right? Like whatever like the canonical bundle of the holomorphic thing variant of like this th -up structure. And so the product structure on S two times R. It's not going to be the same thing as the product structure or the THF structure that comes from this uh, weird holomorphic sphere. Because this thing has no canonical bundle, whereas the canonical bundle of P1 is, a non, is O of minus 1. Um, but like, if you were in a topological setting, uh, like then these things like, just deform to be the same. So like, uh, like as a THF manifold, they're different. But like, I'm looking at a topological theory, so who cares? Maybe, maybe I have a question, too. In, uh, you said this uh, Z of S2 is, is fu ordinary functions on X, but regraded to be degree 2. Yeah. What is the product of degree 0? It's just, so this, it, sorry, the product here is the ordinary product on functions. Okay. And like it's just, the, so just regraded. I mean, it's just the same. Basically, like, if you were to forget this gradings, so this is just exactly my original algebra. I see. And then the Poisson, and the Poisson bracket corresponds to this class in, uh, in a, uh, Yeah, that, that was this class in S2 that I was talking about. And I'm saying that if you calculate, like, what you'll find is it corresponds to the, to the form that's, that's done by the, um, let's see, by the symplectic form. And actually, if you guys all humor me for, like, two seconds, let me just say, what happens with the A model, because I won't go into any detail about it, but in the A model, yeah, maybe the chalk is telling me that I should stop, but so it's the same thing. So what you're going to end up getting like in the end is going to be the homology of the space of maps um, from the bubble into uh, B mod G. Like in the case that your x is a potential level. So this is going to end up being, and the spectrum of this is what's called the Coulomb branch. So then, and this half just came, it's for the same reason that I took this, this half here. Uh, the reason that I lost half of my directions is because when I did geometric quantization, I polarized. Okay, so now I'll stop. Uh, before we thank the speaker,